Good evening, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with the National Weather Service. Thanks for joining us for tonight's edition of Alaska Weather. We appreciate you watching and helping to keep you and your community safe. Uh, you can always check the latest weather forecast information anytime by calling the Alaska Weather Information Line at 1-800-472-0391. It's a free call for Alaska's Inside Alaska. If you're looking for weather information online, of course, our website has you covered. Weather.gov slash Alaska. One click on the map will get you to your local weather forecast office, Anchorage, Juneau, or Fairbanks, as well as links to the Alaska Pacific River Forecast Center, the Alaska Aviation Weather Unit, and of course, uh, the National Tsunami Warning Center for the latest earthquake information should you feel the ground shake just a little bit. Hope that's all it is. As always, if you can't find what you're looking for, I invite you to email me and let me know if I can help you in any way. It is my privilege to serve you uh, in any part of Alaska, and email is a great way to find me just about any time, david.snyder at noaa.gov, and once again, thanks for writing. Love to see your pictures. Here's a look at what we see across southeast and south-central Alaska tonight. No watches, warnings, or advisories for southeast at this time. South-central, though, we're expecting to see some high wind across the region, and we'll likely see high wind watches posted for parts of uh, the western Kenai Peninsula, as well as the Anchorage area as we go into Thursday and into Friday. It looks like we are going to have some wind come up across the region. That's going to keep things warm and it is going to be windy. So a high wind watch will be posted for the area as well as winter weather advisories for parts of the uh, Susitna Valley there. It does look like we'll see an opportunity for rain and freezing rain. Uh, maybe some snow as we get into that Thursday to Friday time frame. In the meantime, the upper Tanana Valley, 40 mile country, and the eastern Alaska range are still under a winter weather advisory. Now, for right now, it looks like a good 8 to 12 inches of snow still possible for the Alaska range. But for the upper Tanana Valley and the 40 mile country, your weather advisory will end tonight. Uh, total accumulations from this certain event, about four to six inches of snow. Out to the west, a little bit of a different story. Around the uh, lower Koyukuk Valley, in the middle of Yukon Valley, all the way down to the lower Yukon, where it's still going to snow. Accumulating snow continues around the upper Kuskokwim, as well as the uh, lower Kobuk and Noatak Valleys. Uh, this entire region accumulating snow, but uh, for the lower Koyukuk, we're expecting to see as much as eight to 12 inches of snow. Again, there's going to be a, a decent amount of snow falling uh, as we go through the period there and it's all because we've got a lot of cold air and a lot of moisture all coming up to meet it. So for the next 24 to about 36 hours, snow will continue to fall in this region and more waves are coming your way. Speaking of waves, a lot of wind working across the Bering Strait. St. Lawrence Island in the western end of the Seward Peninsula under a high wind warning and that's been extended. Now instead of ending tomorrow morning like we were talking about last night, it now looks like the wind probably won't diminish until we get into about Friday afternoon and evening. So high winds out of the east with gusts up to 65 miles per hour possible, as well as high surf. It looks like we'll see waves breaking offshore at about 12 feet, but that certainly means there's going to be some high run up there from the beach, probably some minor coastal erosion if that's continuing. But the possibility is there that you're going to see some of those breakers make their way up the beach a little bit further than normal. So winds out of the east, 65 mile an hour gusts, High wind warnings there until Friday night around 6 p.m. And again, a high surf advisory goes right along with it. So quite a mess for the weather still. Uh, one other thing to point out, an interesting thing around Fairbanks today. Hopefully you can read some of these numbers with me. This was a look at the Middle Tanana Valley around 2 o'clock. If you uh, follow the National Weather Service office in Fairbanks on Facebook or Twitter, you may have seen this. That's where I saw it. And... Um, if you go to NWS Fairbanks on Facebook and just follow them, click like, I'm sure they'd appreciate that. And you can follow uh, the information as it comes out right there on your mobile phone or device. Really easy stuff. And they post the best stuff. Here's a look at the Middle Tanana Valley and Fairbanks. Okay, here's the uh, or Fairbanks right here, I should say. You can see all the different readings around town. All of these numbers are anywhere from about, uh, let's see, seven, four, six degrees to 10 degrees above zero from Fairbanks out to the college. Uh, station area. Here's the International Airport at 8. Now, if you go up about 523 feet in elevation, 
and has a distance of about two and a quarter miles, it goes from six degrees to 24 degrees. Okay, so this would be a really perfect example of what we call an inversion. That's the cold air settling down in the valley. You go up the mountain in this case, and it gets warmer. And typically, we think of our atmosphere as getting colder the higher you go away from the surface of the Earth. But in the wintertime, this is what happens in the middle Tanana Valley. Cold air settles down if there's not a lot of wind, and there certainly isn't this case. Uh, it, it doesn't mix up the atmosphere. So uh, we have a really good example of an inversion here at Cleary Summit. It's 31, and again in town, single-digit temperatures inside of Fairbanks at over 2,000 feet elevation, uh, just northeast of Isleson, uh, 36 degrees. And again, single digits in town of Fairbanks. Uh, Isleson Air Force Base itself, at a lower elevation, only 548 feet, was sitting at five whopping degrees. So there you go. Check that out on Facebook. This was the Fairbanks area around 2 o'clock this afternoon. So good stuff. Great weather example there to share with the weather in Fairbanks. And uh, usually when it's that cold, there's not a lot of wind. And that is what we're finding today. It wasn't the case about a week or so ago. And folks, we're letting everybody know. It was uncomfortable. Here's a look at Wednesday's satellite picture. You can see a deep fetch of moisture moving in from south to north. The jet stream's doing this. You can almost draw the jet in on, your, on the map yourself with this uh, cloud cover here. The southerly moving winds pushing a lot of that deep moisture into northern parts of uh, the Gulf Coast. Yakutat set a rainfall record yesterday. Just to give you an idea of how wet it is, you know it's wet if Yakutat's setting a rainfall record. Across the central and northern parts of southeast, still wet. Uh, the winter weather advisory dropped for the White Pass area. We still have cloud cover moisture working through south central and southwest, not across the west. If you kind of get a little sneak peek of that cold air dropping southward, here's another front and another front across parts of the central and western chain. So we put the fronts on with the surface map. There you go. It lines up perfectly with that satellite picture. The cold is right here across southwest at 974 millibars. It's pushing a front northward. Uh, yesterday, this was looking like a warm front, and we still have a piece of that sitting here. This is now falling apart up north and getting mixed into the greater weather system, but it still has a lot of moisture with it. It's still working that into the cold. And it's still snowing, and it's going to snow. This low doesn't move much in the next couple maps. So keep your eye on that one there if you want to see where the weather's going. It's not going very far at all. Low pressure across the central chain and out just to the west and south of Adak and Atka and uh, Shemya. It's at 978 millibars. And we have several of these waves lined up all the way back to the west. The deep moisture, the really wet and warm air is right here across the eastern gulf. That's what's going to stay over southeast as we go through today and tonight. And look at this mess here across the chain and the gulf. Periods of wind, periods of wet weather moving through and trying to work into the cold, but the warm air is winning. For Cook Inlet, it means rain showers tonight and tomorrow. And uh, for some areas, probably some mixed precipitation. In fact, in the interior, the upper Kuskokwim, as you get closer to uh, places like Tanana and Nanana, and out towards Fairbanks, there's a risk that some of this moisture might just be falling through that cold air mass and you might have some freezing rain in the region. So hard to say if it's gonna be right over you just yet, but certainly the potential is there. Uh, out across Southeast, more rain. Northern Gulf, more rain. Uh, higher terrain, still looking at snow, but mixed precipitation around South Central, yeah, that's an issue. And we're gonna be dealing with wind as it moves through. Look at the pressure gradient tightening up here as low pressure moves into Southwest at 958 millibars. Gales up and down the West Coast with this, and all of this is pulling in a lot of cold air into the bearing and across the West Coast. Notice our pressure gradient here across the Bering Strait doesn't change either. So if you're on St. Lawrence Island and the Seward Peninsula, we're still talking about high winds at this point and gusts up to about 65 miles per hour, high surf as well. Snow will continue across the Brooks Range and the interior. Uh, some areas in the eastern interior along the Alcan should get a little bit of a break. And you can see some uh, pockets of clearing perhaps even there with uh, more of a downsloping wind forming there. And that maybe will even scrub out the inversion that we were just talking about. Low pressure sitting across the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta at 970 millibars. Keeps that southwest flow and wet weather going into southeast. A little bit of a break perhaps coming your way Saturday. And then south central, still breezy, but the real wind continues here across the Bering Strait. Uh, St. Paul and St. George looking at snow showers, rain showers for a good chunk of the Aleutians, and wind developing across the Brooks Range and the Kobuk, no attack valleys, all the way for Ambler, Buttles, and then probably the North Slope starting to get in on some of that uh, more breezy weather as well. We'll take a look at the marine forecast in a minute. A quick check for your temperatures tomorrow. Low 40s around uh, Haines and Skagway all the way down toward Ketchikan and Annette. Still pretty close to 40 degrees. Sitka will be one of the warmer spots at 46. The capital city close to 40. 
Yakutat, 39. Uh, Cordova, Valdez in the mid-30s to about 40 degrees. Talkeetna, you're looking at 38. And again, uh, kind of a messy situation northbound up toward Broad Pass. 30s down Cook Inlet, 39 in Kodiak, lower 30s around Bristol Bay. McCoryak about 24. Nome expect about 13 in the morning. Shishmaref, our friends there, 10 degrees in the morning. One above in Utkiavik, seven below in Kaktovik. Fairbanks looking at temps in the teens and 30s and 40s out west, 30 in St. Paul. A high temperature tomorrow afternoon there, also at 37, no big change. The Alaska Peninsula, Cold Bay, False Pass, King Cove, all of our friends in Pilot Point looking at temps in the mid-40s. 46 in Kodiak, mid-20s for Fairbanks, 9 in Fort Yukon. Uh, looks like Bethel, about 33 in the afternoon tomorrow. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. On Aviation Weather Now, IFR will be fairly widespread across southwestern Alaska into the central chain over the Privilofs and a good chunk of Kodiak Island itself in the archipelago there. And ahead of the next wave of low pressure working across the Copper River Valley, the Wrangell St. Elias region, and approaching the outer coast, we're going to see IFR uh, widespread all the way from north to south there across the eastern gulf. Most of the inside passage of southeast will be looking at at least marginal levels uh, for flying weather and across the upper end of the uh, Copper River as well as the Tanana Valley and the Yukon Valley hit and miss there, and the Kobuk and Noatak Valley, especially the lower end in the Kotzebue Sound, watching for IFR concerns there. Most of the interior, with a few exceptions around Fairbanks, uh, will be looking at marginal conditions. You might see some breaks there across the Beaufort Sea Coast and inland into the North Slope there. As we get into Thursday afternoon, watch for IFR across the Chukchi Coast all the way into Kotzebue Sound, most of the Seward Peninsula, all of southwest Bristol Bay and the Alaska Peninsula into the eastern chain, the upper end of the Tanana Valley, as well as Prince William Sound, Kenai Fjords region, and still lurking along the outer coast, but not really pushing into southeastern Alaska just yet. Remember, we're going to have a wave of low pressure here, another one here, and even more lined off to the back, uh, to the west and south there. So it looks like most of the region will still be in kind of that big slop of moisture hanging over the region with some occasional breaks generally on one side or the other of a major mountain range or hill. As we get into Friday morning, we start to see the possibility of convection showing up across northern parts of the Gulf. And what that means is that any precipitation moving through might have a little more intensity as it does. Might even be a lightning strike or two, but more likely than not, you're going to see some heavier bands of precipitation forming in the region, which of course brings visibility down and brings the ceiling down. And we're going to see that IFR concern all the way from Prince William Sound into really all of southeast, and this time it does make it into the inside waters there. Uh, around Kodiak Island, through southwest Bristol Bay, past McCoryk and Nunavak Island, past Hooper Bay into Norton Sound, and all the way up to Nome, Gamble, and Savunga, and uh, even interior parts of the Seward Peninsula into uh, just about Galena and points south. You're going to be looking at at least a chance of IFR, and more likely than not, MVFR across a large part of the interior. Again, a few breaks there around Fairbanks, perhaps around Fort Yukon, most of your northern passes will be looking at marginal conditions and most of the Alaska Peninsula as well as uh, areas out toward the central chain. By the afternoon, IFR thickens up there across the Beaufort Sea Coast through your northern passes and the Brooks Range, Kotzebue Sound, St. Lawrence Island, all the way down the southwestern capes and pushing into Shelikoff Strait. Prince William Sound uh, looks like IFR and some of the higher terrain, including Juneau, all the way up to Chilkoot and White Pass, looking for IFR there and marginal concerns abound for just about everywhere else, with the exception, once again, of maybe Fairbanks. Here's a look at Anaktuvik and Anagan Pass, looking for marginal conditions for your Thursday in both locations. Lake Clark and Merrill Pass expecting a turn toward IFR as we go throughout your day. Rainy Pass looking for marginal levels there as we go through Thursday. IFR to start there in Windy. Heading for MVFR, maybe some improvement as the day goes on. Isabel Pass also looking at marginal conditions, as is Mentasta at this point, so good news there. And Tanita Pass looking for MVFR throughout your day. Portage Pass likely pushes over toward IFR as we go throughout your Thursday. And Chilkoot and White Pass at this point looking to be kind of an MVFR day for Thursday. That's going to change on Friday. Freezing levels at this point show the surface freezing line all the way over southwest Alaska, bumping up toward Talkeetna in the Alaska Range and then jogging over into the southern end of the Yukon. Two, four, and 6,000 foot levels aloft showing across the Gulf and south for the most part across the Alaska Peninsula. And levels over southeast range from about two to 6,000 feet with that 6,000 foot level over Haida Gwaii. Icing potential has a level below 10,000 feet but above four across the North Slope. And then you can see it really dives off in the west behind that major circulation of low pressure. Above 
above two to about 3,000 feet in the west and above five to seven across south central and above eight across southern parts of southeast. And that's all because of that trough working its way across the panhandle right now. But the main trough there is still to our west. Wind speeds on that uh, trough really ramping up to 135 to 150 knots. And at 9,000 feet, that means a broad southerly flow for most of the interior and the Gulf Coast, looking at wind speeds there at 50 to 60 knots at 9,000 feet. Southwesterly is coming into southeast and northerly is coming through the Bering Strait, heading for the Bering Sea at 30 to about 50 knots. At 3,000 feet, a northeasterly flow just kind of clipping uh, the Chukchi Coast. Low pressure over southwest brings that northerly flow all the way south of the Aleutians and a steady and strong southerly flow across the interior of the Gulf Coast, Kodiak Island, and also southeastern Alaska with wind speeds there anywhere from 20 to 50 knots. So turbulence is going to be a concern, especially across southeast with widespread considerable moderate below 5,000 feet and even some chances for isolated severe below 4 to 6,000 feet in south central and southwest and across the northwest coast. Thanks for joining us for another edition of Alaska Weather Facts. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder, joined again by Eric Stevens uh, from the GINA, or Geographic Information Network of Alaska at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Thanks for joining us again, Eric. Glad to be here. Thanks. Uh, we are talking about satellites today and uh, what, what are satellites? And the easy way to talk about that would be to uh, introduce our friend the globe here, which is a round uh, spheroid type shape. We haven't been on a flat earth uh, as far as uh, history is known for uh, several hundred years now. And because of that, we, we also know that we are orbiting around other objects in space and that objects are orbiting mm -hmm. around the earth as well. We call all those things satellites in some form or fashion, right Eric? Right, well this leads to the discussion of Johannes Kepler's oh, yeah. research 400 years ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, did some of the early work and founded the three laws of planetary motion, which okay. are important to planets mm -hmm. and also to weather satellites. Okay. Kepler's first law talks about how uh, the orbit of an object around another object is mm -hmm. uh, an ellipse, not necessarily a circle. Kind of a flattened circle? Yeah, okay. depending on how I mean, flat it could be. Okay. Uh, for our purposes, we'll just say they're mostly circular. Okay. The second law is most important for us, though, yeah. and that is the closer an object is to the thing it's orbiting, mm -hmm. the faster it goes. So in the solar system, the planet Mercury is mm -hmm. the closest planet to the sun. It orbits the sun in 88 days. It moves at 100,000 kilometers an hour. It's it a lot is different just than Earth. moving. Okay. Right. And um, further out from the Earth is Jupiter, mm -hmm. and it moves at only one quarter the speed of Mercury, and it has to uh, go further. So it takes 12 of our years for Jupiter to make one lap. Hmm. Okay. The further out you are, the slower you go. Okay. So we're talking about planets. Why? What does it have to do with weather satellites? Turns out, Kepler's laws apply to planets orbiting the sun. They also apply to satellites orbiting the Earth. Okay. You know, our natural satellite is the moon. There's right. the famous Apollo 8 Earthrise shot. Beautiful shot. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You could just talk about that forever. <laughs> uh, December 1968, uh -huh. the moon is about a quarter of a million miles away from the Earth. Okay. It takes a month to go around mm -hmm. the Earth. It's that far out, it takes a full month to do an orbit. Another shot here of the International Space Station, mm -hmm. instead of being 250,000 miles out, the ISS is only 250 miles out. It's really close. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't take a full month for the space station to go around the Earth. It only takes right. 90 minutes. Oh. It's so close, it just whips right around 90 minutes. Okay. So weather satellites, there are a number of weather satellites and there are a number of orbits. The further out you have the satellite, the mm -hmm. longer it takes to go around the Earth. And this is important because different satellites have different purposes. So we have a satellite here. This little okay. salt shaker lid will serve as our satellite going around the Earth. Let's say you have a satellite that's 22,000 miles above the Earth. Uh -huh. This is kind of a magical spot because at that distance, it takes a full day for the satellite to go around the Earth. Oh, Imagine okay. if you put your satellite 22,000 miles up from the equator uh -huh. and had it go with the Earth as the Earth spun. At the same speed. Right. Okay. The satellite goes around the Earth just as fast as the Earth itself is turning in effect. The satellite will hover in one spot, oh, I see. and it, it appears when you make a movie loop of picture after mm -hmm. picture after picture, you can replay that and you get these movie loops. Geostationary satellites, these okay. are called, uh -huh. these are stationary in appearance, and uh, they provide a constant frame of reference. We've got an example here, another nice thing about these satellites, since they're that far out mm -hmm. at 22,000 miles, you can see from pole to pole, which is nice. So they're, they're pretty broad view and a constant frame of reference. 
So th those are the pictures. Of, if you're watching a weather satellite loop on TV, your favorite weather mm -hmm. show, that's the picture that you're going to see is one you that's bet. sitting over the same spot. If you're seeing a, a movie loop play uh -huh. again and again, that came from geostationary satellites. Okay. That's the only way you can do that. Yeah. The bummer, though, for us in Alaska is yeah. we're up on the very top of the planet, and mm -hmm. for, for geostationary satellites to work, they have to be over the equator. So for the geostationary bird to view Alaska, it's kind of like reading a book, but you're reading it edge on oh, like that. Right. So there's another kind of orbit called the polar orbit, okay. which is nice. We're near the pole. Yeah. And here's a satellite. Those polar orbiters are much closer to the Earth, mm -hmm. getting down toward International Space Station elevation. And they're not in the equatorial plane. Rather, their orbital plane is inclined okay. like this. And the Earth turns under that satellite as the satellite orbits. Hmm. The nice thing about that is for Alaska, the satellite will go right over Alaska a few times a day. And so you get a much closer image. We've got a a shot from the uh, Sumi NPP satellite. Uh -huh. uh, specifically, it's a true color image from the VIRS sensor. That's an acronym there. Okay. But it's a beautiful shot of Alaska, and you can see so much detail. The kind of detail, because you're close in. Very high resolution. You couldn't yeah. get this kind of view from geostationary satellites. Okay. The, the advantage of these polar orbiters is nice, close imagery. You can mm -hmm. see a lot of detail. The disadvantage, though, is that the satellite flies by, right. and then you have to wait a while to get the next image. And it, if geostationary weaknesses are that you're reading the page like that, mm -hmm. the polar orbiter, you're reading the page straight on, but it's, it's so close. <laughs> and then right. it zips by, okay. and you have to wait for the satellite to come around the Earth again. So there's no one perfect solution. Okay. Different satellites for different orbits. Uh, each has their strength. And amazingly, it all comes back to Johannes Kepler and his laws of planetary motion, the same laws that govern how the planets orbit the sun, they govern how the satellites orbit the Earth, and even our little pretend salt shaker right, right here. Right, okay. Well, since, uh, what, the 1957 Sputnik, we've been uh, putting man-made objects into uh, orbit around the Earth and starting to get pictures back. Who knows what mm -hmm. will happen in the next 50 to 100 years. Amazing oh, it's, it's stuff. It's a growing science, and uh, the future is bright. Thank you so much for joining us again, Eric. And uh, for more information on GINA, and uh, what the satellite uh, systems do there and uh, what Eric's been talking about today, you can go to the web address on your screen. For Alaska Weather Facts, I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder. And now, marine weather around Alaska. And back with your marine weather now, ice continues to fill in around the Beaufort, and you'll see some of that ice curling around Point Barrow west of Utkiavik there, but uh, the warm water here in the Chukchi and the current right now not supporting a lot of growth in the Chukchi itself. However, along the coast in the Kotzebue Sound, Norton Sound, and the YK Delta, we're still filling that out, and look for that trend to continue. There are other storms, though, coming in from the west and southwest that will add more warm air to parts of the Bering Sea, so... It's not going to be a fast freeze up for everyone in that case. You can always see the latest ice information anytime, as well as an outlook here in the next few days, weather.gov slash anchorage slash ice. In southeast, a steady south and easterly wind coming up the inside passage, 35 knots with 6 to 7 foot seas. Their gusts will come up as well. About 30 to 40 knots should be expected, especially around Stevens Passage. Across the outer coast, notice the southerlies here north of Cross Sound, anywhere from 15 to 35 knots in the northern gulf, and northwesterlies coming down from Sitka and Port Alexander, meeting up with a southeasterly flow across the southern outer coast, all at around 30 knots. As we get into Friday, the front moves through. The strong and steady southwesterlies come in. Gales are expected north to south. 30 knots, they're sustained, but gusts coming up to about 45 knots should be expected south of Sitka with 19 to 20 foot seas on the inside, looking at about 5 to 7 foot seas with southerlies continuing there at around 25 knots. Around south central, southeasterly winds coming in at 35 to 49 foot seas inside of Prince William Sound, 15 feet there outside. Uh, you're looking at southeasterlies across the Barrens, 40 knots there with 16-foot seas there on the western side, 14-foot seas there uh, out in the middle of the water, and east and northerly winds coming down uh, through Cook Inlet. It looks like by the end of the afternoon we'll be dealing with 15 to 35 knots, 4 to 13-foot seas across the northern and central parts of Cook Inlet, all due to that strengthening wind coming up over the Chugach. As we get into Friday, southerlies continue at around 20 knots, 4 to 8-foot seas on the inside, 6-foot seas inside of Prince William Sound, and southwesterlies blow in at 35 knots, anywhere from 20 to 22 feet expected there on Friday. 
For Thursday in uh, Bristol Bay, you're looking at 20 knots, a southerly wind there with a six foot sea. Southwesterlies down the coast at 20 knots and southerlies 35 to 40 with 17 to 18 foot seas. Also looking at southerly winds inside of Shellacoff Strait, 30 knots and eight foot seas expected there. By Friday, winds are coming up again across the western Gulf and around Kodiak Island. 35 knots with 26 foot seas, 28 foot seas from Akiak to Chignik and westerlies around Sandpoint and south. 25 foot seas there with a 30 knot wind and 30 knots from the southwest with a 9-foot sea inside of Shelikoff Strait on Friday. Looks to be a pretty choppy day. For Thursday, in the Aleutians, northerlies are coming through. This is cold stuff here. We're talking about 16- to 17-foot seas and 25-knot uh, winds there across the central and eastern chain and north and northwesterly component there. 20- to 22-foot seas across the Pacific waters. You're looking at about 8- to 13-foot seas across the Bering Sea coast, all looking at that northerly wind blowing through. Periods of rain and snow should be expected. 25 knots for the most part on Friday. 16 to almost 20 foot seas south of Unalaska and Nikolsky with that northwesterly flow continuing 13 to 15 feet. And northwesterly is out in the western chain between Adak and Kiska. We're looking at about 13 to 16 foot seas. Still holding onto a northwesterly flow at about 20 knots. Now for the west coast, northerlies are going to be going strong. Notice the ice is building in here across the coast, but it doesn't shut down the wind across the Bering Sea coast. Remember, on land we're talking about gusts to about 65 miles per hour out of the east, and over marine areas, that's a northerly wind at about 40 knots with a 14-foot sea. Also talking about a high surf advisory around the Bering Strait communities and St. Lawrence Island is included in that. Elsewhere, though, 25 to about 35 knot winds are expected. 9 to 17 foot seas are possible. The highest winds and seas will still be out further from St. Matthew. So good news there. Out around Friday, still holding on to that northerly wind off of St. Lawrence Island. No big change there during the day. 16 foot seas in the region of the Bering Strait and north and westerly winds through St. Paul, St. George, and St. Matthew, the highest of which will be around St. Matthew with that 19 foot sea. In the Beaufort, 10 to 15 knot winds over the ice. As you get to Point Barrow, the winds ramp up quickly over the Chukchi. 25 to 40 knot winds with 8 to 14 foot seas there outside of Constantview Sound. For Friday, it picks up even more. Gales going strong here and likely heavy freezing spray warnings will continue as they are right now. 30 to 45 knots with 9 to 16 foot seas there. Northeasterlies pick up over the Beaufort as well. 20 to 25 as we go through your Friday afternoon. So hold on to your hats. Tonight's weather includes a lot more snow across south and west and the interior of uh, the west coast around Galena. Winter storm warning continues for you and periods of freezing rain may be possible. High wind watches are posted for parts of south central and rain continues in southeast. It looks like an unsettled period will continue into the weekend. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbormaster before you go boating.